Well, first of all, let me uh, say how much I appreciate. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Let me first of all say how much I appreciate being invited <coughs> to attend uh, this conference. Uh, to thank uh, my friends in the Pulansas Institute and the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation and in Transform for making this possible. I, I feel unlike the many other times I have been here uh, speaking to uh, the Pulansas Institute uh, and other audiences, I feel more humble more hesitant than I ever have. Syriza is the only political formation of the socialist left that in the context of this great capitalist crisis has come to the point of being capable of going into the state with the intention of not only stopping the austerity, but also of beginning a socialist transformation. It is the only one. And therefore, of course, there have been exciting developments that already began well before the current crisis, which began in 2007, 2008, above all in Latin America, Bolivia, Venezuela, and so on. Uh, but only Syriza in the context of this crisis has come to the doorstep of political power. It's a remarkable achievement and it means that to come here and to talk to you about abstract models, about models that were developed elsewhere and cannot be expected to apply in the concrete situation of Greece in 2014, it seems to me irresponsible. I think that the most useful thing that I can do is to try to set what you are facing in the context of the left today, outside of Greece and to try in as comradely way as possible to pose to you some difficult questions. Because you have put yourself in a situation which is very challenging, much more challenging than we face the left faces outside of Greece because we are not, for the most part, on the doorstep of entering the state as you are. If we take a long-term perspective, what Syriza now has achieved needs to be seen in the context of the defeat of the left that goes back to the previous great capitalist crisis, the crisis of the 70s. It was already the case indeed in the 1960s that my generation recognized that social democracy of the German European type or of the type of the Labour Party in Britain for that matter, even of the type of, of Sweden uh, uh, in the 1960s, was not interested any longer and no longer had the capacity to undertake a democratic socialist transformation. It wasn't interested in it. And if it suddenly got interested in it, it would only divide those parties. They had become convinced that the contradictions of capitalism had been resolved by the Keynesian welfare state. And therefore they were totally surprised and incapable of dealing with the crisis of the Keynesian welfare state. 
The crisis that full employment created for capitalism because it strengthened the working class. Similarly, by the 1960s, people of my generation became Marxists not because of the example of the Soviet Union, or of China for that matter. We became Marxists against the example of the Soviet Union. So in a certain sense, by the 1960s, both social democracy and the communist parties of the Bolshevik tradition had run their historical course as agencies of transformation. Out of the crisis of the 1970s, one saw renewed socialist attempts to build new parties outside of those old ones or to change those parties. And the most impressive in some ways of those attempts were not the Trotskyist and Maoist groups that were formed in the 70s and that never built themselves into mass parties. The most creative attempts were those inside social democracy, the young socialists in Germany who were expelled by the early 1970s from the Social Democratic Party. Many of them went on to found the Greens and they were the uh, more radical elements of the Greens envisaging recall, the rotation of delegates, etc. Right. Or the attempt inside the Labour Party, which took a decade until it was defeated, the attempt by, led by Tony Benn, which was based on the understanding that we cannot achieve socialism unless we democratize the very undemocratic British state, and we can't democratize the British state until we democratize the labor movement, which was itself not democratic. That was defeated because, with every right, those who ran the Labour Party were able to say that we are not engaged and haven't been engaged for 30, 40 years in the attempt to change Britain into a socialist society and they were prepared to divide the party rather than see the democratic left, the democratic socialist left, take over. The Euro-communist attempts in the 1980s, of which Sinaspismos and Syriza are in a sense the offspring, for the most part did not succeed either. In fact, you could now say, looking back, that the one great success, in a sense, was seeded right here in Greece. And you've engaged in a 20, and 30, 20 to 30 year period of building the type of support, the type of strength, the type of perspective that has brought you to where you are. Just before Tony Benn uh, passed away, uh, I was, knew he was very ill and I was thinking about a conversation that he and I had in the 1990s. It was a very sober conversation and we were discussing the extent of the defeat of trade unionism and of the left, especially in Europe. And he asked me how long it would take, did I think, until we would see a renewed socialist movement that would revitalize working class politics. And I said I thought we were in for a long period. Maybe a period like that that separated the Chartist movement of the 1830s in Britain and the defeated 1848 revolutions on the continent of Europe from the emergence of mass labor and socialist parties by the 1890s. That was a 40, 50 year period. Yes. And he thought for a minute and then he said, in that case I'll have to live till 120. <laughs> I'm very glad he died last week at 88 that he lived to see Syriza. And just last November we discussed it. <laughs> 
when I say that only Syriza has come to the doorstep of power with a socialist project, even with an anti-liberal project, I don't mean in any sense to make light of the achievements of the left party in Germany, of the alliance that emerged in the last few years between the PCF and Mélenchon and the League Communiste, the League Socialiste, the Trotskyist organizations. But they are, in a certain sense, not in any way in the position you're in. And there is a disjuncture in time going on. A disjuncture in time between what is happening politically here in Greece and where the rest of the left is, especially in Northern Europe. And in a sense, that's the question you're posing to us. What does international solidarity mean in this context? It first of all means recognizing on the part of socialists outside of Greece really the remarkable set of objectives that Syriza has set itself. It has come to the position it is while having in a central place in its program the socialization of finance. You would think this would be obvious even to Keynesians given that the latest crisis was rooted in capitalist finance and in the centrality of capitalist finance to capitalist global production now. It isn't just speculation. Global production depends on international finance. It depends on the movement of capital. It depends on derivatives which allow firms engaged in production around the world to hedge their exchange rate risks. So it began in production, and yet only Syriza, and I must say most of the intellectual left doesn't even raise this, has put centrally on its agenda the question of the socialization of finance. It is inevitably, therefore, put on the agenda what the American empire is most worried about in the context of globalization, and that is capital controls. You may remember that after the Asian crisis of 1997-98, only Malaysia introduced capital controls. And it frightened the IMF and the American Treasury enormously. No other country followed. It would have been necessary, and indeed it was being discussed in Latin America, that there would be a coordinated system of capital controls, but that wasn't achieved. The way in which Syriza has put on the central agenda, and we just heard it from the first speaker, the necessity of democratizing the state, has not been defensive about the nature of the Greek state, but rather has taken the lead in the need to articulate how to reconstruct public administration inside Greece, in a democratic way, subject to public accountability and participation. And above all, and I have to say, when I read the English version of your political document from last year's Congress, in the summer, the founding Congress of Syriza, I really felt it was the most creative socialist document by a political party of the left in the last 40 years. And I felt that above all because of how it concluded. It concluded almost poetically. It concluded by saying, I, I brought it with me but I, I won't obviously read it all, but it said, the state we're in today calls for something more than a program. It calls for the creation and expression of the widest possible militant and catalytic political movement of multidimensional subversion 
that will operate in a spirit of solidarity, elation, and inspiration. And it goes on to say, we are not doing this to go into government where the people delegate to us total responsibility for changing the world. We only can do what we can do insofar as there is continual popular pressure from the outside. That's a very big statement. The tragedy of both social democracy and of communist regimes has precisely been that once they have entered the state, they have in fact demobilized. Because of course it causes you a problem if you're in government to have a mobilized people. It's a headache. You have enough problems to deal with. And yet you're encouraging people to be a militant, catalytic movement of subversion from the outside? Yes. And yet that's the only way it can happen. It may not happen even then. But it's the only way it can happen. So it's a remarkable document. That said, I think the most useful international solidarity is not just to complement Syriza. Of course, given the situation you put yourselves in, the 20 year struggle you've engaged in, the support you've given to the social movements, the way you've inserted in yourselves in them so that you're not appealing to be using them just to get into the state, but to build the movement, we all admire. And I must say, it puts us in a difficult situation. Because it's our responsibility Above all, it's the responsibility of the left in Northern Europe to give a series of government breathing room. Whether you stay in the Euro or whether you're kicked out of the Euro, and I know you don't want to go, but who knows how Europe will respond, will partly depend on whether there is a shift in the balance of forces in Northern Europe that will give you some breathing room. Whether you stay in will partly depend on whether they let you stay in, when you insist on seeing through your goals. And if you're kicked out, the degree of maneuver you have will depend on whether there's a shift in the balance of forces that will mean that you're not isolated and penalized. And I can only say that it's our responsibility to do everything we can to try to ensure that those balance of forces are favorable. And I assure you that socialists like myself will take that responsibility seriously. But we also can't do the kind of thing that the famous English Fabians, Sidney and Beatrice Webb did in the 1930s when they went to the Soviet Union in the middle of the Stalin show trials and said, we've seen the future and it works. There is a tendency on the left, especially where the left is weak, to see something going on someplace else and to treat it like a cargo cult. Ah, we don't know how to make a revolution here, but boy, those Greeks certainly do. They've got it all figured out. Yeah. And we invest all of our hopes and all of our aspirations in something going on over there. I felt this very strongly during the World Social Forums in Porto Alegre in Brazil. <coughs> where we all went and rarely asked hard questions. You know, the Workers' Party in Brazil, which emerged out of the dictatorship in the early 1980s, 
presented itself, thought of itself as a post-social democratic and post-Leninist socialist party. What was most impressive is it said that when we get into the state, we will continue to be cadre. We will continue to be organizers. We will use our position in the state. We will use the resources of the state to continue to help organize the unorganized. And already by the time they even got into municipal government, they weren't doing it. Now they partly weren't doing it because they hadn't thought through how to do it. They hadn't built the party infrastructure to know how to do it. They partly weren't doing it because they had been the critics of patronage and clientelism in the Brazilian state. So when it came to hiring a bus to take a group of dispossessed workers or farmers to Brasilia to protest against the policy, they would be accused by their opponents of engaging in patronage and clientelism by hiring a bus for poor people to go protest. And they got frightened and they backed off. Even their greatest success, the participatory budget, we rarely asked hard questions about. Yes, it was true. Women who had not had an education from the favelas were given the opportunity of whether to decide that a certain very small allocation of funds to their favela would be used to build a road or to build a sewer. And, that, and they did it and that was impressive. But they were never brought into the strategic conversations inside the Workers' Party. They were never brought into, the, their capacities weren't developed to engage in discussions about the strategy around class struggle in a broader sense. Right? We needed to be asking those questions, why? Not to accuse them, because this is a very difficult thing to do. But so we could see the problems they were having, why they were having them, and attempt to bring that back to our attempt to build the kind of movement that would be capable of doing this. So I'd like to ask of Syriza, and I hope this is useful rather than not useful. What is happening inside Syriza, not only to prepare yourselves to enter into government, but to build the militant and catalytic <coughs> movement of subversion that you will need as much as getting into government. And because I have some very close and dear friends and comrades who have been in Syriza from the beginning, I hear some of what you're doing, the solidarity networks and so on. But it's very important, I think, for the left outside of Greece, and for yourselves to be discussing whether this is taking place in a way that is developing the capacities of the many, many tens of thousands of people who you will rely on outside of the state to understand what you're doing, to support it, to criticize it when necessary, to shift the balance of forces inside Syriza between those who will see themselves only as parliamentarians, inevitably as career representatives, and those who see themselves still as cadre from inside the state. And I hope we can discuss this. I hope we can learn from this. I think by making this clear to yourselves and to the left outside of Greece, you can only increase the enthusiasm and support. Now, I know this isn't easy. I know that when I ask, is there a plan B? In terms of when you go to Europe, and you say, that's it, we are not implementing neoliberalism. 
Not only we will not have any more mem memoranda, we have a plan in place and we will implement it to start re-establishing the social safety net. And I know you will do this. <coughs> if the consequence of that is that you're pushed out of the euro, if there is a plan B, and I'm told there is a plan B, I realize it's difficult to discuss this because you'll be attacked for it in, in the media and it may hurt you electorally. But if you don't discuss it with your own base, if you don't discuss it in the solidarity networks, then are you preparing the people you'll rely on after the election to be able to understand why you do one thing or another? The same is true with changing the public administration. Are you developing the capacities inside Syriza to be able to develop the kinds of people <coughs> who can go into the state or who can make the state accountable to the broader public that you want it to be? The great danger, and it's happened in Bolivia, is that all of your most effective cadre are going to end up administering the state. Who will be left in the party? In South Africa, you know, after the ANC and the South African Communist Party went into the state in 1994, those who stayed in the labor movement, those who stayed in Kasatu, we're seen as the losers. Could this happen here? Again, I just want to conclude with this. The problem is one of the difficulties of balancing time. Different measures of time. I was in El Salvador in 1994, invited to run the first educational program as the FMLN was turning itself after the peace agreement, after the Civil War, from a guerrilla army to a political party. And I had a conversation with uh, the man who later became a presidential candidate, Facundo Guardado. He had been the subcomandante on the El Salvador, San Salvador volcano. And he said to me, you know what's wrong here? People think of the long term as the next presidential election. In fact, that's the short term. My hope is that by the time of the next presidential election, which was going to take place three, four years later, that we will at least have a viable party organization. The medium term is 2010 when I hope we will have enough support in the country that we will be a major political force. The long term is 2020, 25 years later, by which point I hope we can go into the state and transform it. And the woman who was running the educational program, Angela Samora, said in that case, I'm leaving the party. I can't go back to the people who've been engaged in fighting a civil war since 1981 and tell them they have to wait until 2020. And of course, it's the case. People, you have put yourselves in the position you're in. Because Cyprus said, and I'm sure it surprised some of you, we want to form a government to protect our people against what's happening. We have to form a government to put a stop to this. So it is this disjuncture in time, the time, the time you need Guardado wasn't wrong, right? And the necessity of reforms. Hopefully the kind of reforms that build on to further reforms, the transformative reforms. So I'll just end with this. Uh, Tony Benn got, got it exactly right, and I want to pay tribute to him, because he's one of the few politicians of the 20th century who became 
a more radical democratic socialist, a more committed democratic socialist than when he began. And he became it out of his experience in government when he realized how little he could do in government. And he said this, uh, that he faces, and we all face, the usual problem of the reformer. We have to run the economic when you get into the state. This is the usual problem of the reformer. We have to run the economic system to protect our people who are not, not locked into that economic system while we try to change the system. And if you run it without seeking to change it, then you are locked into the decay of the system. But if you simply pass resolutions to change it, without consulting those who are locked into the system, then you become irrelevant to the people you seek to represent, who need more than socialist resolutions. They need more than socialist rhetoric. We cannot content ourselves with speaking only to ourselves. We must raise these issues publicly. We must raise this difficulty publicly and involve the community groups because we champion what they stand for. We must win the argument, broaden the base, not only to win the election, but to generate the public support to carry the radical policies through. Thank you.